Hey, good morning, everybody. We're glad that you are with us. I uh, want to begin this message. Uh, first of all, I'll give the title. This is going to be Biblical Thankful Thinking, Part 2. So, some of you are aware now that this past week, it was announced that the FDA wants to uh, change our uh, trans fats. They want to go after the uh, hydro hyd hydrogenated oils and do away with them. Let me just say this to begin with. I understand Rush Limbaugh's arguments on this and the government needs to stay out of it and, and I am in agreement partially with that and sympathetic with it. But I also see how God can even use our federal government to do good things from time to time. Now, I've been warning people, Doug Evers has been warning people, many of us have been aware of the dangers of hydrogenated oils. And so I am glad that there, in a sense, that this awareness is coming about. Uh, when you stop and you think about all the different ingredients that uh, have hydrogenated oils in it, it's, it's scary. And it has been bad and, and dangerous for our health in many, many ways. But I saw this in the paper this past week, and I don't have the copy of it with me, but I did write it down on the board here, part of it. There's so much more, and they did a pretty darn good job of it in the Spokesman Review. And so it says, um, it explains... Hydrogen, partially hydrogenated oils, are artificial fats. And it, and it ranges them from low to high in their danger. Of vegetable oil, semi-liquid margarine, soft margarine, stick margarine, and shortening. Notice how short margarine is listed over and over and over. For many, many years now, when I've been at a restaurant at Eaton, uh, I mean, I realize you're not getting perfect food by eating at a restaurant, but you can do certain things to uh, help yourself by asking them not to pre-butter your bread. If you're going to get bread, I'm not going to get into what type of bread to eat and hurry that right now. I don't want to get too lengthy into this. But one thing you can do is say, please bring my bread dry to me with butter. If you want to use butter, you can get it dry. That's perfectly okay. Unfortunately, even when you're eating bread a lot of times, you're getting margarine in that or shortening in that. So there's nothing perfect, but I would certainly recommend that you get real butter. There are certain restaurants, more and more, that are using butter. And they will tell you that and they proudly display that. But on the good oils that you are to eat, well, let me just stop here. For a second and ask this question. Is anything missing from here? Well, I don't want to keep you guessing because I've already given, let the cat out of the bag in a sense. Nowhere up here is butter listed. And for how many years now have we heard over and over and over, butter is bad for you. Butter will get, cause heart attacks. Notice they don't list butter in this. They listed it in another below where there are the, these good oils you can use. They're not necessarily perfect, but they're much better for you than these hydrogenated trans fats that are here. And in there, one of the first things they listed was butter as being good for you. And of course, they have coconut oil and palm. It's, and, and this would include uh, olive oil. So... I just had to stop and point this out that isn't that interesting that this is coming uh, to light now, something that we've been warning people about and you should have known about if you've been paying attention to uh, Doug's lectures over the years. He's been telling you a lot of these things and that's why he has said that you do need to take uh, fish oils from time to time. He has the good EPA Omega uh, fish oils. He has... Uh, he has coconut oil, coconut capsules, 
And those are things that you can use to supplement your diet that will actually put good oils in your body that will fight off the uh, bad oils that we get. And uh, uh, there are many other things that we can do, of course, to improve our health. That's just one little area, though, but I thought that was interesting. And uh, again, I know, I know what Rush Limbaugh says about government intrusion, all this stuff, and I agree. But I also have to say, well, thank God that this educational process, not that I trust the FDA. You know, you have to, you have to think through this stuff a little bit. But God's working in this. I can see God working in this. And that, uh, I know that they're doing this for the Obama health plan. But interestingly enough, why might they be doing it? Because they realize the high cost of heart attacks and bypass surgery, it's killing them. They can't afford it. And they're now, they've known this for years. But now they're just now coming out with it to tell you this because they're realizing this is going to sink them financially. And my dad had a heart attack in the 60s, and the doctor told him, Yeah, they told him, Yeah, exactly. And of course, lard in this, eating lard is bad for you. Um, and this is just kind of a side note here. Uh, I was watching a, uh, a thing on Alaska, and they were uh, showed the, the, uh, this family going out and shooting a bear up in Alaska. And um, they were saying, well, we need this to supplement our diet up here, and we, and et cetera, et cetera. But they had this warning on there, be very careful about eating bear, because, you know, bear is just a, a, a big clawed uh, pig. That's all it is. And uh, you should not eat it. That there is parasites in this that are very, it, it's, uh, it's dangerous. It's caused a lot of health problems for people from eating bear meat. And I thought, how interesting that they're warning people of this uh, about bear which, and it's not a clean animal. Again, people would pay attention to what the clean meats and the unclean meats are, and just do that alone, they would be far better off. Okay, let's move on with our message on uh, Biblical Thankful Thinking Part 2. I want to share this with you to begin with. Uh, a person once said, or uh, way back when, asked Stradivarius, uh, who uh, built, designed the Stradivarius uh, violins, I guess we could call it. Violins and cellos. Violins and, cellos. and uh, of course, he is noted for Stradivarius for perfecting the uh, violin. And he, uh, to this day, no one can match what he did. What he did was so unique and so special. And it created such a, a, and a, a wonderful tune and, and from his violins that uh, they haven't been able to match it today. Well, anyway, uh, they ask him, how long does it take to make a, a violin? Stradivarius said this, quote, a thousand years. He went on to say that a violin can be made only from a tree that is tempered by the wind, beaten by the sleet, scorched by summer, and blasted by the ice of winter. A thousand years. In other words, it takes a very strong, weather-worn tree to make a violin. A, prote a protect protected tree would never do. And you have to stop and think about that. People want to be protected. They don't want to have to experience the troubles of life. They don't want to have to experience disappointments. They want life to be given to them or handed to them on a silver platter. Some people think that away. It's actually not to your benefit. Now, Again, we're talking about being thankful. I wonder how many of us can be thankful for the stresses of life that God Almighty has put us through. That we thought were for our harm, but actually 
they were meant for our good now that we can look back on them. It is often the people who have experienced failure who can realize the gold in their life. Handel said this, quote, Our antagonist is our greatest helper. I'm going to repeat that. Quote, Our antagonist is our greatest helper. End of quote. Now when I first read that, I really had to scratch my head on that a little bit and think about it. And all of a sudden, it just came to me. Wow! Could this be why God Almighty gave us carnal minds? I can't think of a bigger antagonist than my carnal mind. The other night I went to sleep and we all hoped for beautiful, wonderful, loving, kind, uh, just uplifting dreams. But do we have them all the time? No. In fact, sometimes we can have some of the most bizarre dreams that you wonder, where did those thoughts come from? How could I possibly have dreamed that? Uh, but uh, so that's the way our carnal mind can be from time to time. And I think there's lots of reasons for it, but I think it's also a filter that God Almighty allows us to filter out evil, bad, wicked, terrible thoughts from time to time. It's a way of releasing them, perhaps. I mean, we, we sit there and we look at bad, wicked, and terrible things as, as uh, unessential, no purpose in it whatsoever. But I really believe that as we study God's Word and we think about these things, that there is a greater reason to these things than what we may at first, or on the surface, realize. The Apostle Paul <clears throat> was a very thankful individual. And uh, I want to share this verse with you from 2 Corinthians. I may not be reading this in your particular translation, but he said this, quote, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmity, infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, that when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. Can we say that? Can we look at our infirmities? Can we look at our problems in life and say, and say, I thank God for them? Now you talk about having a heart of thankfulness. That's where it really gets kind of tough, doesn't it? Amen. And yet... This is what the scriptures tell us. And what does that do to our carnal mind? It, it really knocks it. It really takes it for a loop, doesn't it? And, uh, uh, but if you think about it spiritually, it, and you think about it long enough in prayer and meditation about what that really means I think it'll bring you to the point where you can say, praise God for my uh, problems. Thank God for my uh, disappointments in life. Thank God for those hard times that I had to go through because they actually, God used them, though I didn't realize at the time, to make me stronger spiritually. Problem, uh, that was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. You may say, well, I'm just ordinary. Well, I want to use another verse for you here from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 27 to let you know and take heart in this that God uses ordinary people. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 26. 
For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are mighty. Here we're given spiritual principles that really boggle the mind. And yet there is a spiritual purpose behind these things. I often wonder, and I miss the point I think oftentimes, is how do we grow spiritually? You would think on the surface in thinking about this that the way that we grow spiritually is for lovely, wonderful, beautiful things to happen to us and that we just glide along in spiritual blissfulness. And uh, that's how we grow. Actually, that's not how we grow spiritually at all. We grow spiritually when there are difficulties, when there are things that we need to overcome and we need to face. But our carnal mind will run from those things. I thank God that Jesus is in charge of my life because many of the things that I ran to would actually have destroyed me and put me on the wrong path as I look back on my life. But it's the things that I ran from in, in many ways were the very things that God Almighty used in powerful spiritual ways to develop me. Now again, that causes my carnal mind to blink big time. And it, 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 uh, it, really, it really rattles my cage. I like to state that. This cage, in a sense, that we are in. God Almighty uses these infirmities. He uses these persecutions. He uses these tribulations. However you want to play, uh, uh, state or, or refer to them as ways of making us stronger spiritually. You see, the Apostle Paul would not have been able to do what he did. He would not have been as near as successful in his ministries had he not been the type of man that he was, which was very carnal, even antichrist, if you stop and think about it. The life that he lived prior to him meeting Jesus on that road to Damascus when he got knocked off of his high horse. And so, I thank God for knocking me off of my high horse. I don't know about you. And he's had to knock me off of it a few times, actually. Well, let's turn to Isaiah now. Uh, I, ha I have to uh, say these things that I just shared with you because we need, all of us, to understand that these spiritual paradigm shifts that the Holy Spirit places upon us and moves us, uh, moves us into. And of course, we're not aware of these things, again, and how he's using these so-called, quote, negative examples, these negative positions that he has placed us in. We do not see right now clearly the negative blessing that God Almighty is placing or moving upon us as a people and as a nation because of Obama being our president. Now that will blow your mind when you really stop and think about that one. But actually, I believe, and I quoted this to you last week, if you will remember, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and call according to His purpose. Yeah, I believe that. And I believe that even for us as a nation and as a people, even though we're experiencing the negative, 
even though there is this great outpouring of mystery Babylon and all of its merchant evil, just call it that way, that we're experiencing today as a people, as a nation, God ultimately is going to use those things to bless us. How exactly? Well, you know, let me put it this way again. It's not up to me. I can't tell you. I could tell you various ways in which that's going to happen. But here's what we need to do again. If we sit there and we wrestle with what the Holy Spirit is telling us all the time, I think you're going to miss out on the blessings. I think the blessings is stepping out in faith, which is, a, which is not necessarily an evil thing. It's a different way of approaching the problem. But the scriptures tell us in faith we are to do these things, and it is in faith, as chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews tells us, that our forefathers, our Christian forefathers, overcame and received the blessings, and they received thankful hearts. It wasn't easy for any of them in what they did. Do you think it was easy for Moses to go through what he went through? Do you think it was easy for Noah to go through what he went through? There's always things that we need to face and overcome and deal with in our life, but how are we dealing with those things? Are we trying to figure them out with our carnal mind, our carnal reasoning, or are we moving and living in faith? Now, when we're talking about faith, I always, I don't know why it is, but the Holy Spirit always brings to remembrance the Abrahamic covenant. You see, that, that covenant is far more powerful than what we understand, I think, in many cases. Let's go now to Isaiah 51, chap, uh, 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 chapter 51, verse 1. And we've read these over before, obviously. But let's really think about them. Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Again, when we're, when we're reading these verses here, I want you to think about the fact that God Almighty, our Maker, our Creator, created us, and He did not make a mistake. You people out here, you may think you're mistakes, but you're not mistakes. I am not a mistake. I know some people think I am, but I am not a mistake. I am not perfect. I do not walk on water. I never have claimed to be, but I am not a mistake, and neither are you. Our Creator, our Maker, created us with a higher purpose and a more glorious purpose. And all these things that we are experiencing and living are part of that greater cre cre creature, that greater blessing that He has purposed us for. I'm just planting some seeds right now. Verse 2, Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. Think about this. He talked about Abraham and Sarah. He talked about the blessings there. And he increased it. And then he gets into Zion. He's talking about the kingdom, right? The Lord shall comfort his kingdom people. And he will comfort all her waste places. Uh, does... Does America need healing today? Does America have waste places? Yeah. What's that? Detroit is one of them. Detroit is one of them, yeah. No. Canada, you have the same problem, right, Canada? All you Canadians, uh, those of you in Europe and England and uh, South uh, Africa and Australia, etc. The nations where in time regathered Israel people are, 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 are living right now, we're all experiencing this, and we've all, in a sense, become waste places. 
Well, what good could come out of that? Well, God has a purpose in it. And I can, take, I can have joy in my heart with a renewed spiritual understanding of this. A, 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 a whole new way of looking at this that the Holy Spirit can only give us. And by the way, the only way that we can see that is in faith. We have to practice and live by faith in order for us to see restoration. In order for a spirit of restoration to flow through us and become a part of our lives, which makes us also, a, brings us into a ministry of redeeming the times. Isn't that what the scriptures tell us? That he's given us a ministry of redemption? And there, that we are to, his people are to say, restore, restore. He's given us a word of reconciliation, a word or a ministry of restoration and redemption that can only develop, that can only happen as we walk and we live in faith and also that we have and live and manifest a spiritual demeanor that is Holy Spirit directed, Holy Spirit given of thanksgiving. All right. For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and a voice of melody. Thanksgiving and a voice of melody. Many times we read that over. And we will think of some other verses that uh, are very similar, and we're going to read some right now. But he says again that he's going to do this. He's going to bring about these great changes in Zion, and that joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving, and the voice of melody. Do we hear in Zion... Do we hear in our nation? Uh, joy. We don't hear that. Gladness. Do we see gladness? Do we, uh, do we have thanksgiving, a spirit of thanksgiving and a voice of melody? No, we don't see that in here right now. Well, you know what? God's promised that that's going to happen in Zion, does He not? God's called us therefore, into a ministry of joy, gladness, thanksgiving, and to have a voice of melody. Now, I know this can get a little bit deep and a little bit mind-boggling. How is that going to happen? Well, I know when it will happen, Pastor, when I get a million dollars. When I... When I get all my bills paid for, I'll be happy. Yeah, you will be happy. I, I really believe that. Wouldn't you be happy if you had all your bills paid for and you didn't have any financial uh, concerns or burdens upon you? That'd be great, yeah. But do you really think that that's what these verses are talking about? Don't you remember what I just read for you earlier? The Apostle Paul says, In mine infirmities, in my tribulation, in my persecutions, I'm a happy man. I have a heart of thanksgiving. What? Then something obviously is missing from our spiritual demeanor if we don't have that as well. Why don't we have that? Was Paul some special individual? No, I just read for you the verse after that. Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul wasn't unique at all. In a sense, that God Almighty uses ordinary people to do very unusual and powerful things spiritually. Now don't 
Don't stop and think that Pastor Barley understands all the full ramifications of what I just told you there, because I'm not so sure that we can. I think the only way that we can understand that is through spiritual, biblical eyes and understanding. That there's, there's something over our eyes that's blinding us and therefore blinding our mind. You cannot fully understand with your mind oftentimes until you can fully see with your eyes. And many times it's because, wow, we got my eyes open, I can see, and I can see clearly what the problem is now. But, but I could only see half of it or a quarter of it. I needed some spiritual eyes, Seth, to open my understanding, to give me light. And then, as I, that happened, I could start moving and functioning in faith more. But here's the key to really get to that position, and that is to live by faith. You can't get it on your own. All right. Uh, Ephesians. We just got through reading here, Thanksgiving and a voice of melody, right? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Ephesians 5. And verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. How can you do that? Can you, do, you, do you, any of you think for one moment you can do that on your own, through your own initiative, through your own might, through your own power, or do you think this is going to take faith? It's going to take faith. That's how... In Hebrews chapter 11, they all succeeded. It was through faith, not through any works of their own. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Yes. All right. So you do this, and there's an awakening, and Christ shall give thee light. That's what the scriptures say. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, now, is this talking about worldly wisdom? Does this mean, is God Almighty telling us? Obviously not. This is a rhetorical statement. But He's not telling you to go to the universities of man and get a degree and become enlightened. Is He? I don't read anywhere where Jesus went to some university and got a degree. I'm not saying you can't do that. But the world loves and respects doctors and PhDs and all these other things behind their names. And I'm not saying you cannot be a wise person, an educated person, and do some of these things, but I am telling you that that's not how, that's not what the scriptures are talking about here. The world out there wants you to get an education. Of course, what are you going to get when you go to the universities? The liberal arts. You're going to get. You're going to get an education that is diametrically opposed to what the verse, these verses of scriptures are telling you. Okay. Now, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Didn't we just talk about that in a sense? Redeeming the times, uh, the time because the days are evil. Well, are we living in evil days? Yes, we are. Uh, then, what are we waiting for? What do you mean? Yeah, what are you waiting for? You waiting for the times to get good before you wake up spiritually and we start doing anything? Or possibly, is now the time? Because what? Because the days are evil. I didn't say this. That's what the scriptures tell me. And if we don't believe the scriptures, and we don't think the scriptures are telling us, who's telling you the truth then? NBC, C, uh, CNN, Fox News, whoever out there? No, none of them. The universities? No. Where, where are we going to get the truth? From the Lord Jesus Christ, from the Word, His Word. Okay? Redeeming the times because the days are evil. Well, the days are evil, 
and there are things that we can do to redeem the times, and it's not going to be done through the physical. It's not going to be done through any of the carnal approaches and ways of men. It's going to be done not by my, your might, not by your power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's a scripture verse. Look it up. Look it up. By my spirit, saith the Lord. Keep it a little homework. That's how things are going to change. In other words, we're not looking to our own selves. There has to be a change within our minds. Our carnal minds, like I said earlier, are the problem. And God gave us a carnal mind, though. How odd. God gave us a carnal mind. But He's using that carnal mind for spiritual things that we don't really understand. He's one thing teaching us that you can't trust your carnal mind or your carnal thinking. If you haven't figured that out yet, I don't know where you're at. If you really think you're the genius and your carnal mind knows the better way, you're barking up the wrong tree and you, you're, not, you're not alive in Christ. Jesus Christ is not your Savior, He's not your Redeemer, and His Word really doesn't have much meaning to you. I can guarantee you that. But if Jesus is alive in your heart, if you're reading His Word, and His Word, and it will act as this, as a spiritual deter detergent to wash away all this crud that's in there, and to give you a new mind, to give you a new way of thinking. And the only way that we can do this is to live in faith again. To apply what the scriptures tell us are the principles of faith. Now faith is the substance of what? What? Things hoped for. It, it's, it's the substance of Christ because Christ is our hope. And then, as you're living and moving and having your being in Christ, you can be a part of redeeming the time. That's all Apostle Paul was doing. That's all the Apostle Paul was doing. Wherefore, be not unwise, think about it, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Man, these are powerful verses. I guess, where have they been? I've read them and read them and read them and read them. That's what I love about the scriptures. You can't exhaust the truth of God's word. Amen? Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Now, I'm not sure how much wine is excess. So don't ask me. I don't know. Uh, for some people, my, my advice is don't even start. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it would get me off in another area if I went into that much further. But what does it say, though, at the last part? Be filled with the Spirit. That's what's encouraged. We are encouraged not to be filled with wine. And people do, tur do turn to... Um, uh, alcohol, don't they? In various forms. And, uh, and uh, they want to feel good. Well, it, you know, maybe it does make them feel good. But the answer and the solution is to do what? Be filled with the Spirit. Really? Yeah, that's what the Scriptures tell us again. Be ye filled with with the Spirit. Well, how do I get filled with the Spirit again? Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My burdens are not like the world's burdens. My, my solutions are not the world's solutions. I'm higher. Remember last week we read, and we're going to get some of those verses maybe in Colossians, where it says, set your affections on the things above. We're not setting our affections on the things above. That's the problem. All right. Speak to yourselves 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, didn't we just read those verses in the Old Testament earlier? Melody, thanks, having hearts of thanksgiving. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I didn't say that. That's what the scriptures tell us to do. Might we see a difference? Might we experience a difference if we applied just what we're reading here? I suggest to you, no, I don't suggest, I'm telling you, we would. I'm not saying I'm the most thankful, joyful, pleasant person of wonderful, peaceful, joyful thoughts. I wish I could tell you I had them all the time. I know my carnal mind is still functioning and interfering in my life, but I know this. If I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I lean not to my own understanding, in other words, I say, carnal mind, shut up. Carnal mind, get out of my way. Satan, get thee behind me. Carnal mind, you're interfering with my spiritual growth, and I'm not going to allow you to do that. So I'm going to give thanks, and this is how I'm going to give thanks, as what we're reading here. It says in Psalms, might that mean reading the book of Psalms? Sure. And, but it says uh, hymns, songs, that we can, we can have a joyful, we can make a joyful noise, that... Um, it's, it, we're encouraged to sing. You know, I've noticed one thing about people, and I don't sing because I don't have a good voice, but I want to say that's probably no excuse. I don't think it's an excuse. I think that if we get up there and we sing as unto the Lord, that somehow we are releasing and being a part of spiritual blessings. Which makes me feel a little bit better because every Sunday I have to come up here and I can't sing and I have to sing, be the song leader. And I've, I've, been, I've been holding a grudge against the Holy Spirit many years over that, that why couldn't you bring me a George Beverly Shea or somebody like that who has a wonderful voice that can lead the people in music and, instead of this worthless piece of flesh here, Jesus? Well, what am I saying? What am I saying? I mean, there has to be something to this. It doesn't put qualifications that you have to be a good singer and you have to join a choir and you have to be trained in music before you can ever do that. Now, I would say that's certainly a plus. And if you have a voice, you should use it, right? But uh, what if we don't have that kind of a voice? You think about... Uh, the disciples that were in jail, right? What did it say? It says they sang hymns. You spiritually blind. What were you doing? Trying to torture that jailer to let you out? I mean, what, what, what's going on here, guys? Come on, really. I don't think they had beautiful voices. I, I just don't think they did. But they sang still. But they were releasing and getting in touch with something spiritually that we have failed to understand. And I'm saying not everybody. Some of you may say, Pastor, well, I've known that for years. I'm spiritually uh, elevated. elevated. Okay, I'm more power to you. You may be. More power to you. But for those of us that are not as spiritually elevated as you, I think this is powerful spiritual light that maybe we need to think about a little bit more. And it has to do with being thankful. You cannot sing praises without having hearts of thankfulness. Now add that to your understanding of biblical thinking. Biblical thinking. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they got me in jail. Well, give thanks. Are you crazy? Are you crazy, Pastor? Well, I may be, but the Scriptures aren't. How's that for an answer? 
I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm amazed at this in so many ways. And I know I'm not expressing it the proper way to you that maybe I could be, but I'm doing the best I can. And by golly, God's called me. God's given me ministry. And whether I succeed or not, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. That's all he requires of us. That's all we can do. Okay, Psalms uh, 95, let's go there. It may get a little heavier. What's that? I said, Earth today, we read you. Okay, okay, somebody's got it. All right, uh, Psalm 95. And we'll read the first seven verses. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Now, wow, what? Jesus, are you trying to tell me something here? Maybe he is. No, maybe to it he is telling us. Uh, sing unto the Lord. Come, let us do this. And let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. He didn't say it has to be a beautiful, uh, perfect pitch voice. He just says, do it with joy. Whoa. You can't do this again without having hearts of thanksgiving. You can't do it, have a, make a joyful noise. You cannot do it. Therefore, we have to have what? Hearts of of thankfulness unto our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our hearts need to be filled with all the spiritual blessings and wonderful things He's done for us. Which means we don't value the worldly things, we value the spiritual things. And that one you're really going to have to chew on. I'm not going to have time to go into it right now anymore. Because I've got to get some things said here. And it says, to the rock of our salvation. That is the primary reason, because we don't value our salvation, nor do we understand it sufficiently enough. I don't think. I think we just kind of bypass He saved us. Oh yeah, Jesus, you did a wonderful thing on the cross. You suffered, and I do appreciate it, Jesus. But do you really appreciate it? Do you really appreciate the fact that He died for you upon the cross? Now, now there you go, Pastor. You're sounding Judeo-Christian. No, I'm sounding biblical. And I'm just reminding you of some things you might have forgotten or overlooked along the way in your deeper understanding of whatever you're thinking about or praying about or studying in the Scriptures. That you must never forget that He has saved us with a tremendous salvation. And we need to have hearts of thankfulness because of that. You cannot progress spiritually and leave that out or bypass that. It's impossible. I don't care what you think or what arguments you present to me. You really need to have a long talk with your carnal mind if you can't understand what I just shared with you there. But let us move on. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. And make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Now, you know, we could stop right there and say, you know, that's just Old Testament stuff, right? Except for the fact we just read that in the New Testament. Amen? Has he changed any or have we changed? I think we have. And I think we need to get back on spiritual track. Okay? And, of course, we need his help and we need his guidance in order to do this, or it isn't going to get done. But He will help us. I believe that, don't you? Amen? He's promised us that He will. So, all right. For the Lord is a great God. Is that your understanding of Him? Or is He a mean, a mean God? He doesn't give you what you want. He, you don't... You don't have a big house. You don't drive a new car. In fact, you, your car's a, 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 <laughs> ready for the junkyard, probably. And uh, you have to go out and pray for it every day to get it started. <laughs> yeah. 
Some people have vehicles like that. And you don't have uh, um, what you would call a good diet. I mean, there are people, believe it or not, you know this as well as I do, that have to eat beans a lot of times, right? And rice and things like that. I mean, their, their diet isn't, quote, really good. And, of course, we understand they'd even eaten the typical American diet today where you're having meat and you're having potatoes and, and all this other stuff that you had on there, what people would think of as a uh, uh, good old American diet, is full of junk. It's full of these hydrogenated oils in a lot of cases that we're thinking about here, right? It's really not that good for you. In fact, I, I remember having a conversation with somebody a long time ago. They were telling me about their diet. It was like that, uh, what you wouldn't call a, the good old American diet at all. It was more like eating simple foods, just very plain, bland, simple foods. And they were very healthy. And I was like, wait a minute. You know, that sounds exactly like Daniel's diet and what happened with Daniel. And Daniel, before the king, the king... Uh, Shadrach, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Daniel and his buddies wanted to have a diet of what? Fruits and water. Probably veggies too, I think, but there was definitely fruit. And where the king wanted them to eat what? They, steak, beef, and wine, strong drink, and that that would make them more healthy and wiser, and yet the Babylonian diet was contrary to the real spiritual diet that they should be eating. You see, there are spiritual foods, and there are Babylonian foods. I know that we're talking, you, you want, or you, you want, you want to play, place it all in the mind, but if you're, that's how our minds are sometimes cleaned out and renewed, is through eating proper spiritual food, good spiritual food. You see, when it comes to the world, the world wants to be um, a lot of them. True spiritual Christians, no way, shape, or form. I understand that. But a lot of the world, they're, they're not Christian. Look at our world today. They voted for Obama. I mean, how can you call them Christian? You can't. I don't care. I don't care what your excuse is. I'm going to get myself in trouble on this. And I know an older man. He's white, lives down the road down there, and he, He's in his 80s, but a hard-working, helpful, good man he is. But he's proud as can be that he voted for Obama. And he'll get mad at you if you say anything against Obama. And I'm like, how, my dear soul, how, my dear friend, did you get to that position where you thought it was good and you still think it's good, and you'll argue and get mad against anybody that says anything contrary to Obama? And you're white. Well, obviously he was a Democrat, but that doesn't explain it to me completely. Part of it it does explain, explain to me. But when you stop and you ask him some questions and you start getting to the bottom of it, all of his benefits are from the Democrat way. In, in other words, well, yeah, um, uh, um, the uh, the term that I'm looking for, it's, it's uh, slipping my mind right now, but it's, it's wealth redistribution. Redistrib let's, let's get it out, Dave. Redistribution of wealth. That's what he has made it on all these years in working government jobs and having government positions and have government positions. He doesn't want to lose it. Really? Those are your, yet he was a hardworking man. I think he was a good, honest man for the most part, but really his political views was okay with stealing because that's what he wants. He believes in Obama's, Obamaism where you take from one group, the haves, and give to the have-nots. Black people, for the most part, love that. I know there's more growing that are coming out of that thinking. Thank God for that. There are some. We can't put them all in that negative category because there are some good black people that realize that that's stealing and that is actually destroying our nation. Good for them. But there's a lot of white people also, like I say, that had to also vote to put that 
uh, infirmity into our office, high office. But yet, when I think about it on another level spiritually, you know what? I can join him and say, praise God for Obama. Well, I didn't get any smiling faces out of anybody here. Let the record show that. Hey, I understand that, but you have to try to understand what the Word of God is telling us. That in a, and though we may not fully understand the reasons why he's in office, I think he was our best solution and best answer for awakening God's people up. And we have to, we, we have, to have it. Okay, well, um, how, let, me, let me see there. I think he was telling me my time is up. Um, where did I where, where, where did I read to here? Uh, I got law. Okay, let me read through these real quick. I have to I have to close. I'm sorry. Uh, which sadly means you're going to get a part three of this. But I think I don't think you're tired of it, are you? Okay. Thank you. All right. For the Lord is great and a great King and above all gods. Uh, which means our Congress, which means our uh, Supreme Court judges, you name them, we got them. Uh, in, in His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is also His. You know, what isn't His? What doesn't belong to Him? What doesn't He control? What doesn't He have a divine purpose in? Okay. The sea, the sea is his, and he made it. Wow, think about it. the oceans, the seas, the waters. It's all his. Uh, the Philippines, what did they have? A big typhoon, 200-something miles an hour, they're saying. I mean, tremendous devastation. Was God behind that? Yes, he was. I don't understand why, but he has a reason for it. And I'll bet you if you really understood why it was happening, you might actually say, wow, do it again, Jesus. I mean, I don't know, but I'm just saying, I'll bet he has a reason that if you really understood what was going on in the Philippines, that I think that they, there was something going on there that they needed it. Well, what if, what if a big, you know, that's easy for you to say. No, it's not really easy. It's just what the scripture, I'm realizing God's sovereign. That's what this is all about. And he has his reasons, and I've got to trust his reasons. Oh, yeah, how loving are you going to be, Pastor, if you get cancer, or this happens or that happens to you? I'm going to have to say, praise God. There's some reason behind it. That's how you're growing spiritually. Well, do you really think the disciples and the Apostle Paul, if he had cancer or some infirmity? Well, the scriptures tell us he had an infirmity. I don't know exactly what it was. Some people say he had a problem with his eyesight. I don't know. Some people say he had other uh, types of infirmities. But I know he had some infirmities, fleshly, physical infirmities. And you know what? Scriptures say he praised God. Why should we be any different? <laughs> I knew a lady, as I've told you all before, in the Baptist church long ago. Her name was Helen. What a tremendous lady, a beautiful spirit. Yeah, she was Baptist. But I remember uh, her, go her going to people in the hospital. She loved helping people and praying for people. She loved it. And she went to people all the time. I remember half a dozen times being in the hospital, and uh, we would get there, and she'd be there bringing flowers and praying and, thank and saying hi uh, hello to us and learning our names, and, and uh, just ministering to us spiritually. And I'm like, wow, I wish. I remember leaving every time thinking, I wish all Christians were like that. This lady is such a blessing to I don't even know her, really. I know she goes to church. I know she has a beautiful spirit. I don't know where she's getting it from. That's what I thought. And I fully don't understand to this day. But she lived in a very nice house. Oh, I see. She lived in a very nice house. And one day, after all the helping she did, she herself developed cancer. And she passed away. But I've talked to people, and uh, people that knew her. And I want to tell you, 
where she, uh, where they had the uh, funeral, it was in a huge Baptist church, Castle Hills Baptist Church in San Antonio. And uh, that thing was filled over capacity. Couldn't get everybody in. It was, she, she was loved that much by so many people. And I'm not saying the masses are what we put our faith in. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We go, oh, see, we need to look to the masses. No, it's not what it's all about. But the, minute, the, the, uh, the testimony was to her dying day, she had a thankful heart and a heart of joy. And she went through all the suffering. She had gone to people over the years and prayed for them because of their infirmities and their suffering in the hospital or at home or going through divorce or going through hard times. She was there. That was part of her ministries. Sometimes she couldn't make it. Sometimes other people obviously in the church would have to go and do fill in. But she, that was, boy, she, she did not shirk sure, sure responsibility, but it was all possible, all that told me, witnessed of her. She was there. What a testimony. And what a difference and what an impact we can make. All right. Uh, so, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. This is where I've got to close. It says, verse 7, For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if He will hear His voice. Can you hear His voice? And it says that the Lord is our Maker. Forgive me for this last illustration. But it's what the Lord gave me, and so I'm using it. I believe the Lord gave it to me. The Lord is our maker. Made me think of Dr. Frankenstein. How dare you? Well, I'm not saying God's Frankenstein. It said it made me think of that story. What about it? Dr. Frankenstein, as the story goes, went and got body parts and created a monster. But he wanted to create something really wonderful that the world would be in awe about and say, wow. You know, and so he wanted the creature to have a good mind. But what happened? His assistant went to, to go steal this mind that they thought was normal mind. He picked up an abnormal mind and put it into that creature and it became a monster. Well, thank God our God wouldn't do that. Well, hold on to your horse. God, our maker, gave us carnal minds, did he not? Whoa! You mean that God created us all monsters? No. But he created us with carnal minds to show us spiritual things that our only way of deliverance is through Him, our Maker. And that we have to surrender ourselves to Him and completely do His will. And that our minds need to be renewed and we need to put on the mind of Christ. That's what our Maker has called us unto. That is what our Maker is really doing for us. And when we stop and understand that, I, I, the bubbles of thanksgiving just start coming forth. A joy and a smile comes upon my face that, wow, I see hope where I didn't see hope. I understand now that He is our blessed Savior. He is our blessed Redeemer. And there is a wonderful ministry of reconciliation and redemption that is all a part of why He created us and this creation, which is groaning and travailing for the sons of God to be revealed. Let us close. Heavenly Father, we thank You for just these powerful spiritual principles You've shared with us here. And I pray that this wonderful God knowledge, and it is Christ-focused, Christ-centered, Christ-glorifying knowledge will grow within our hearts, with our understandings, that our minds may be renewed, that we may be able to 
live and move and have our being in the spiritual way with a spiritual purpose and a spiritual function with joy with the hearts of thanksgiving that you desire of each and every one of us but we must put on the mind of christ we must turn to you and realize you're our only savior and our redeemer the only way out of this is if we fully put our faith in you and function and live and move and have our being in this spiritual blessed process. Amen and amen.